Uh, today I'm going to talk about the empathy problem, which I discussed in Chapter 6 of my book, The Moral Foundation of Economic Behavior. Uh, the empathy problem is based on a very simple insight. Uh, often in very large groups, the harm caused by any particular act of opportunism is spread over so many people that there's actually no specific person uh, who is harmed enough for us to empathize and therefore sympathize and therefore feel guilty about having actually harmed. My goal today is to convince you that the empathy problem presents a serious obstacle to scientific, social, political, uh, and economic development because it makes it hard for us to trust each other uh, in large group contexts and therefore it impedes large group cooperation. Obviously, uh, groups are going to play a big role in what I'm talking about. I've already dropped that word a few times. So let's talk a little bit about group size. Going back at least as far as Adam Smith, uh, we've known that specialization is an extremely important thing. Uh, if, if Human groups that don't specialize are consigned to poverty, no question about it. But moreover, specialization has more than proportional returns or exponential returns with respect to group size. In other words, the bigger the group is, the more thoroughly you can enjoy the gains from specialization. That's the good news. But the bad news is, is that the problem of opportunism worsens dramatically with group size too. And that's for two big reasons. First of all, the opportunities for opportunism go up more than proportionally in large group. And secondly, our natural reluctance to behave opportunistically tends to wither in large groups, and that's the, the core of the empathy problem. Now, why would opportunities for opportunism go up in large groups? Well, just think about it for a minute. If the big advantage of being big is to be able to specialize more, then that specialization is going to lead to a dramatic localization of knowledge. There's going to be a situation where many people are going to know a great deal about what they do and how they do it, as well as the details of time and place associated with doing it on a day-to-day -day basis, but nobody else really knows. This is going to create, what I show in the book is it creates a more than proportional increase in the number of golden opportunities, to borrow a nice phrase from Bob Frank, very powerful idea. And that, that creates a real problem uh, for firms and for society in general. Why? Well, in human history, we've had big things for a long time. You know, think Roman army. And we've had entrepreneurial people and entrepreneurial firms for a long time. Those things aren't new. But what is very recent on the scene are very, very large things that are also very entrepreneurial throughout their hierarchy. That is a very, very recent thing in human history. And uh, another thing that's very recent in human history is something like the general prosperity that we enjoy in the United States. That's not a coincidence in my view. Uh, having the ability to cooperate in the largest possible scales is, in my view, the key to unlocking human potential. And that's why it's so important that we be able to have these kinds of nodes within which such cooperation occurs. But in order to do that, we have to trust the people who have this localized knowledge and these many opportunities to act on it with no chance of, of being caught. Uh, with trust, we have to be able to trust them enough to give them the discretion to act on it. So the question then is how do we get decision makers to refrain from acting on golden opportunities so firm owners can in fact trust them with discretion? Well, I nominate uh, guilt. Uh, here's a, I, I, I hope I don't offend anybody with the word rational here, but this is a very simple, simple little model. Uh, this is net utility. This is utility from the benefits of, of undertaking an opportunistic act, X, and uh, C is the cost of, of opportunism. Um, the bottom line is if we can come up with a way to make uh, decision makers feel guilty about having behaved opportunistically, then we can drive up the C term and therefore make the V term negative. And in that way, you can make opportunistic behavior irrational. The beauty of using guilt is that even if the person's behavior can't be observed, if they've internalized this, they're going to experience that cost term anyway. So it can also deal with golden opportunities. So that's the name of the game. The salient point that's easy to miss, though, and, and really the, the substance of what I'm going to talk about, is that it turns out that it's not enough to just really care about being a good person or uh, things like that or care about other people. Precisely why you feel guilty makes a great deal of difference. So the content of moral beliefs ends up making a great deal of difference. Okay, so let's get right to the nature of the problem itself. 
The bottom line is, if wrongfulness, your basic implicit theory of moral propriety holds that wrongfulness is derived solely from harmfulness, just think of this as kind of an extreme mill harm principle type position, uh, then many acts of opportunism in large groups simply won't feel wrong. Simple example, um, there are many people who you might trust your child with as a babysitter, who you might also suspect exaggerate their, or, or the kind of person who would exaggerate their deductions on their taxes to get a larger return. Now, how could that possibly be? Well, many people are able to rationalize that sort of thing for a very simple reason. If you get an extra thousand bucks from the federal government, that means a lot to them. But in reality, there's no question that there's not a single human being, actual human being, that's harmed in any way by that action. So if the reason why you feel guilty about things is because you think they're wrong, and the reason why you think they're wrong is because they hurt somebody, and you know you're not going to get caught, there's no reason not to do it. And that's a serious problem with things like golden opportunities because you believe you're not going to be caught. So here's the nature of the problem. We expand the C term now. I've got G of X, which is guilt, H of X, which is total harm, and N, which is the number of people in the group. And let's assume that the harm is more or less divided evenly over the group. Now, the reason why G is multiplied by H is because if we're going to think about uh, wrongfulness as a result of harm, then what we have essentially is a theory of harm-based moral restraint, which I believe is, there's ample evidence that that's kind of like our original equipment. Well, it's not hard to see what's going to happen next. If you drive N to infinity, that ratio goes to zero, and guilt ends up being moot. Now, the rub of the problem, of course, is that while the C term ends up disappearing, the U term is perfectly preserved. There's no N in there. So from the person's point of view, if they know they're not going to be caught, do it. This is really a big problem because this means it's, it's possible for a person to be completely rational. There's nothing irrational about this. And moral, if they happen to have a theory of morality that contends that wrongfulness derived from, uh, from harmfulness. So it's, it, you can be completely rational and moral and still act on all golden opportunities. That's just devastating for a society that wants to be able to benefit from engaging in cooperation in very large groups where an awful lot of people are going to have many, many opportunities to take advantage of the fact that nobody else really knows what they're doing. Now, this is a, a shockingly simple idea. I realize you all probably feel that way. So why is it that more of it hasn't been made up until now? It's also, I, I have a, an explanation for that, but uh, it involved too much spooky math for, for Jonathan, so we skipped that. But uh, let me briefly mention uh, why it's a particularly hard problem to solve uh, intuitively. Well, one's first uh, impulse about how to solve this problem would be to say, well, if we can gin up moral earnestness, make people want to be moral, uh, to a greater degree, that could solve, that could deal with it. Well, that's not going to deal with it. If your moral restraint is harm-based, then the fact that you want to be really moral is going to be completely moot if you don't feel like you've done anything wrong because nobody got harmed. Increasing concern for other people, that's not going to change it. How much you care about a particular person is going to be irrelevant if they're not harmed in the first place. Inculcating something like Hillel's rule or the golden rule to effectuate generalized reciprocity that's not going to solve the problem either. It's very easy for someone who's considering an opportunistic act that's going to have these properties to say, hey, you know what? If I was one of these so-called victims out there, if I was one of those guys, and I knew some guy could get a ton of money and only hurt me by half a cent, I'd say, fine, do it. Go for it. So that's not going to do it. Imploring people to not behave opportunistically because it's socially irrational, in other words, it's bad for society as a whole, that's not going to work. It's called a social dilemma for a reason. So how, in fact, do we, and I would argue have we, uh, solve the empathy problem? Well, the key to solving the empathy problem is to attach involuntary feelings of guilt to negative moral actions per se. So in other words, in the brain, what we want to do is we want to create a neural pathway from the contemplation of an opportunistic act that loops around that normal mechanism of perception, empathy, sympathy, and then guilt. It, it just doesn't end around to it and attaches feelings of guilt directly to the act. 
I, I imagine almost all of you uh, experienced this with your own parents when you were very little and you did something that was wrong and you tried to justify it by nobody got hurt and your parents said, but that doesn't matter. And then, they, then what they did then is they, they played a little bit of uh, mental gymnastics with you and they tried to make you feel guilty about being a thief. Well, now, see what they've done there is they've redirected the attention away from the victim and the harm to your own self-perception. That's a very clever thing to do, and it's a very important thing uh, to do, and I think it has a lot to do with success in countries that enjoy high levels of trust. So how do we do that? Well, bottom line is we add a term to the, we, we have the old uh, harm-based moral restraint term here. Here's G super P of X. Uh, that's guilt that's a result of believing that an act is inherently wrong. P is for principle. So the idea there is we can, if we can build up principled moral restraint in people, then no matter how big n is and this goes to zero, you, this guy's still hanging around. So if we can make this term big enough, we can make that term negative. We can make it irrational to behave opportunistically. And I think that's very close to what Herb Gintis was getting at when he was talking about, you know, with this morality thing, you know, this is a good thing. This is something that people should be able to embrace. Okay, some quick and dirty observations. Uh, if I'm right, to some extent, our small group moral sensibilities are maladapted for supporting the good life. We are a small group species. Uh, small group ideas like harm-based moral restraint do a terrific job producing order and effective cooperation in small groups. But if the group gets large enough, that withers and it might not give us what we want. Another implication is we shouldn't take much solace in the fact that much of our morality is derived from our hard wiring. There's been a number of books out. Um, Mark Hauser has one. Uh, Shermer has one. Trout has one. Fukuyama had one. That touts uh, the fact that, hey, much of our moral behavior is hardwired. Doesn't it make us all feel good? Well, it makes me feel good. I, I take great uh, solace in the fact that much of our morality is hardwired. I think that's terrific. My point isn't that there's anything wrong with that argument. My point simply is that's not enough. It does a great job explaining uh, most trust for most people in most societies most of the time. The problem is most societies aren't that great to live in. What we need to do is be able to explain or understand the kind of trust that exists in the kind of societies that produce the kind of life that we want or that we've already have and take for granted. That's the bad news. The good news is we can, and I believe to some extent have already, used our cerebral cortexes to invent ideas to circumvent problems like the empathy problem to make it possible to trust each other in large groups and therefore enjoy the benefits of large group cooperation. <clears throat> now I'd like to talk a little bit about an implication for moral philosophy, moral psychology, and uh, the teaching of business ethics. You know, the empathy problem is really an example of a broader problem of small group moral intuitions. And most of our evolution, of course, took place in very small groups. As a result, the psychological traits that support cooperation well in small groups had ample reason to be strongly reinforced through natural selection. For this reason, small group ideas like harm-based moral restraint are relatively easy to inculcate because the mind is already well prepared to receive them. But things are very different for invented ideas uh, like principled moral restraint, particularly the ones that are pertinent to large group cooperation. As a small group species, uh, nearly all of our throughout nearly all of our evolutionary history, there has been no payoff uh, to evolving psychological traits uh, or mechanisms to support cooperation in large groups. It was simply a moot point. This means that we are much more naturally inclined uh, to teach and learn, understand and feel in our gut small group moral ideas and we are large group moral ideas. That's really unfortunate because uh, while it's very important to have small group harmony and small group cooperation, uh, if economic activity is limited to small groups, poverty is assured. All of this is the result of humans figuring out almost miraculously a way to cooperate over in unfathomably large groups, and that is all fairly recent. A dozen Nobel Prize winners on a deserted island can't even make a toaster. 
I mean, that's just the hard reality of it. In my view, large group moral ideas, like principled moral restraint, produced a giant leap forward in cultural evolution because they supported cooperation in much larger groups than ever before. This had Promethean effect on scientific, social, political, and economic development. Unfortunately, the resources for moral instruction are finite. If we're naturally biased to focus on teaching small group morality, it follows that we will probably spend too little effort teaching the kinds of moral ideas that are associated with large group cooperation. That uh, also points to another kind of problem that I've worked out, uh, that I'm working out in a current book, which is many of these gains that occur in large group cooperation are several steps removed from any individual's actions. So that creates a bit of a public good problem associated with the inculcation of those types of moral beliefs. So that produces a very high bar and a very big challenge for ethical instruction in societies that want to enjoy the benefits of large group cooperation. And that's my talk. <laughs>